You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. I have a cold, so that's uh, that's why I sound so baritone-ish here. I don't know. I don't know if you like it. You don't like it. I don't know. But uh, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, before we begin today's show, I want to remind you to uh, visit wealthformula.com and uh, you know check out the resources there. It's also where you're going to go if you want to sign up for some of our lists, such as the accredited investor list. Uh, we have a number of uh, opportunities coming uh, down the pipe this year in several areas, including real estate and aviation and mergers and acquisitions, all sorts of stuff. So if you're an accredited investor and are interested in participating in that kind of thing, make sure to uh, sign up for Investor Club at WealthFormula.com. Now, as you know, I have uh, uh, three daughters, uh, age 14, 11, and 8. The oldest one is Camilla, and she's now in high school. And for those of you who've been listening for me for a while, uh, that might come as a shock because, well, the, she did an intro uh, for episode 100, where I thought like I think we're at like I don't know 500 now. I don't I don't even know what we're at. But she did an episode for 100, and she was a little girl, and so she had little little girl voice on there. Uh, and it's just a reminder that we're you know we're getting older <laughs> by the minute, and when you have children, you realize that pretty quickly. Anyway. I was recalling that, you know, at around that age that she is right now, 14, is really when I started to think about the world in a greater context than simply ice hockey and food. I mean, that's pretty much what my world was about until then. And um, so because of that, I've been trying to have some more meaningful conversations with her. And so recently I decided to talk a little bit about political science definitions and that's something I thought was interesting because you know I remember in ninth grade learning about that and not really understanding that much about what it meant to be quote-unquote conservative or uh, have liberal ideology and so I wanted her to understand the basics of these kinds of political theories just so you know she had a uh, and she just start forming her own idea so i told her about conservative ideology values uh and you know the talk of uh, the uh, value of uh the individual that conservative ideology has uh, the advocation for small government i even quoted ronald reagan um, as an example of somebody who is uh, maybe a believer in this kind of ideology where he said the nine most dangerous words in the english language are I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Uh, of course, um, you know, some of us think that's funny. Liberal ideology, on the other hand, puts greater value on the collective whole of a people over the individual. In such a belief system, the emphasis on equality generally trumps individual achievement. It focuses on redistribution of wealth, uh, and uh, that allows for uh, the government to provide services to serve everyone. And while you know uh, that I certainly have a bent towards the more conservative ideology, I actually wasn't trying to persuade her one way or another. I wasn't actually putting, uh, I was trying not to put, you know, my own uh, feelings into this, although, you know, I'm, she knows. <laughs> but my goal for her was to simply think about her own opinions and ultimately to, you know, have an interesting conversation and, and share what she believed with me. But she wouldn't. She got really uncomfortable. And when I pushed her on why she was so uncomfortable, she admitted that it really had something to do with the fact that her mother and I don't agree on some of this stuff. The funny thing is that while her mother and I certainly do disagree on some political issues, we actually never fought about it. Uh, we aren't married anymore, but that was never an issue for us uh, from a, a, you know, a conflict thing. We actually never uh, had any emotional uh, conflict over it. You know, it, it just goes to show that these days it seems like, you know, everybody shies away from political disagreement because if you disagree with somebody, you can't be friends or family anymore. 
Uh, disagreement has been replaced by disagreeable, right? You can't, if you don't agree with somebody, you can't, you can't be friends with them. And that's a shame because these discussions are, in my opinion, incredibly valuable for people to ultimately discover their own true values rather than simply clinging to a, a, a tribal political party instinct. You know, just for example, listen, I'm, I, I am uh, identifying myself as having conservative, uh, conservative ideology, but I have plenty of disagreements with current, you know, quote unquote, conservative uh, Republican Party. For example, the party shifted away from fiscal responsibility. There's no, there's no fiscal responsibility there anymore. Any, you know, measures of austerity or anything like that. Uh, the party no longer seems to believe in free trade and really de-emphasizes civil liberties. And these things are all part of, you know, what real conservative ideology is all about. You know, the true tenets of conservative uh, ideology. So certainly there are what having an education, this stuff helps you understand like what you really believe and compare and contrast that with what any, you know, parties are actually offering, which is generally not, none of them are pure, right? I mean, uh, none of the parties are, the conservative party is not conservative. The liberal party is not really all, you know, is not entirely liberal either. There's a mix of stuff. So just trying to identify that is really helpful. And, you know, I think per particularly for young people to start to think rather than caught up in the tribal warfare of parties and that kind of thing. I think that, you know, having more open political discussions without emotion would be good for everyone. It would also help, uh, again, what's really under, you know, potentially happening on the global stage. You know, I would say that while America has really been the, the, the real mecca for the individual since its inception, it's starting to move in a direction of a more liberal global arena. Uh, that values uh, uh, personal achievement and success less than the whole. I mean, all you have to do is go back to the last uh, election cycle on the Democratic side. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders was way ahead for a little bit, um, and um, and it was it was almost uh, reality that you know there was going to be a true socialist on the Democratic ticket. I mean, that's. Um, pretty remarkable for the United States, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, but, you know, it's not just me who's noting, noticing that kind of thing. My guest in Wealth Formula podcast today, he is a best-selling author who's been uh, sounding the alarm on the coming of the new world order, where he describes it, you will have everything you need, but nothing will be yours. Is she being an alarmist, or is this a real concern? Decide for yourself, and uh, you can do that by listening to this interview when we come back after these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast is Carol Roth. Uh, Carol is a recovering investment banker and entrepreneur, TV pundit and host, and the New York Times bestselling author. She's worked in a variety of uh, capacities across many industries, including currently as an outsourced CCO, as a director on public and private company boards, as a strategic advisor and C-level Consigliere. She's the author of You Will Own Nothing, Your War with a New Financial World Order and How to Fight Back, The World on Small Business and the Entrepreneur Equation. Carol, welcome. That's so great to be with you. I, I am hanging tight. How are you? Good, good. All right. Well, let's let's get into this. This is a interesting topic. So uh, you know, your your whole thesis here ultimately is that there's a serious movement to stop personal wealth creation. You want to explain what's going on, why you believe that to be the case? Sure. Well, I think, you know, to, to kind of back up from there, I think the first thing we have to establish is that the global financial world order is likely to shift at some point. And while we cannot predict that with certainty, we can certainly, uh, in terms of time, we can see the trajectory. And when I say things like new world order, new financial world order, that sounds very conspiratorial, I'm sure, uh, yeah. but it really isn't. This is something that shifts on a regular basis throughout the generations. The U.S. has been in in the pole position of the global financial order with the world reserve currency for about 80 years now. But before us, it was the British and before the British, it was the Dutch. So this is something as uh, you know, historical cycles shift, 
you have different countries that come up and sort of assert themselves in that middle of the, the financial world order. It's also something that is talked about very openly um, in the media by people in power in a very non-conspiratorial way. You can go to the White House website right now. You can see comments from President Biden to the Business Roundtable, which are the CEOs of all the large companies in the U.S., most of the publicly traded companies and whatnot. And March 21st, 2022, his remarks talk about this phenomenon, and he says that you know, basically um, every few generations there is a shift, you know, as we were talking about in the world order. And then he says there's going to be a new world order out there, and we have to lead to lead it. And I'm assuming when he says we to the people in the room, he's talking about you know these big powerful uh, business institutions and him as a, a, a powerful uh, political leader, but not necessarily the we with you, Buck and me, Carol. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out on that. But, you know, as I was sort of doing research into a lot of the issues that were impacting wealth creation, um, you know, whether it is you know, what the Federal Reserve and government and central banks around the world have been doing to the U.S. dollar and, and other central bank fiat currencies, and government fiat currencies, um, you know, whether it's things that uh, have popped up around you know, uh, cancel culture and, and the like, whether it's the fact that Wall Street is now competing in the U.S. with individuals for single family homes, whether it's colleges that are, you know, making it impossible for young people who graduate with degrees to actually accumulate wealth and so on and so forth. I was really looking for a tie in and going, OK, what does this all mean? And that's how I stumbled upon that that meme. You will own nothing, and you'll be happy. And went, oh, you know, this this all sort of pieces together because you know, as things shift and change, if you're powerful and well connected, you want to hang on to that power and that wealth. You see that happening, and you know, if everybody else doesn't own anything, doesn't have those opportunities for wealth creation in the meantime. So be it. It's the reason why they say you'll own nothing and not will own nothing. So is the idea that the 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 creation, the wealth, the barriers to wealth creation are being um, put there by more wealthy private sector or more from the government? I mean, I guess that's sort of two different things right, right? there's there's three so you, you yeah. hit two, and, and that's the crazy thing and so you know as these sort of global stakes are shifting everybody's jockeying to get into position to you know be able to protect what's there so you have different entities that are all not necessarily working together but you know working in the same direction so you have what i would call the government entities, you know, government, government related, the straight up governments, the central banks and the like, then you have, um, you know, sort of these what I call them the bad actors, which some in some cases are these non governmental organizations or international organizations or big businesses. And then big tech is sort of its own, like, you know, fiefdom of, its, of yeah. itself because they are trying to really wrench your life back to you as a subscription or a service for their own benefit. And we've seen that. We've been kind of groomed to do that in our lives. Um, so you do have all these different forces. I call them the sort of collection World War F, a financial world war where we're all effed because you do have all <laughs> these forces that are each individually trying to say, here's how things are shifting and we're going to you know, do this for our benefit. And in the meantime, you know, the the average person is finding it harder and harder to own things. And I know, you know, this is a, a, a focus for you, you know, with wealth creation as somebody who's advocated for that for more than you know, 20, uh, more than 25 years. Um, we know that wealth comes from ownership. Right. right. You have to own things. You have to own assets that can store value or appreciate in value. So the idea that people who are connected with um, you know, the, the elite business people and the elite political folks are running around and predicting by 2030, the end of private property, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy 
is really concerning. And then the, the whole notion that like, if you're at all a student of history, you know that people who haven't owned things have not been wealthy, they have not been free, they have not been happy. And in many cases, they starved to death. So yeah. it's kind of a, a very staggering backdrop to sort of explore each of these topics individually. So how does property ownership in particular, um, I think you, you, you've you referred to it as the backbone of wealth creation. Yeah, right? it, I mean, it is. You know, as I said, you have to be able to own assets that can store and appreciate in value in order to to gain wealth. Um, you know, obviously that comes in many different forms. You can own a business as a small business owner. You can own stock in a variety of businesses as a participant in the stock market. You can own real estate, um, which may include productive land or your home. You can own collectibles. You can own precious metals. There are lots of different ways to mm -hmm. own things. But that's really how people take the money that they've earned and put it to work for them, where it doesn't just sit there. And as we know um, from what has been happening, you know, through the Federal Reserve policies and some of the government policies, that the purchasing power of those dollars that we earn are actually decreasing in value. So we want to put that to work for us so we can, at a minimum, keep up um, right. with that or, you know, hopefully ex exceed that opportunity. And then obviously it depends on the category, but if you have something like a home, for example, in the United States, the house is the biggest driver of, of wealth, of net worth for families across balance sheets across the, the United States. So when you see a place where it's harder for people to go in and own a home and when Wall Street is coming in for the first time ever and competing with individuals to buy homes, you know, that is is really saying we want to take that wealth that mm. normally goes to Main Street and becomes legacy wealth and transfer that opportunity to Wall Street. And, you know, mm -hmm. that is not um, particularly, you know, yeah. kind of consistent with the way that, you know, wealth creation happens or sort of the American fundamentals. So I'm curious, uh, you know, when you think about the different D different forces that uh, you're talking about here, some of them are sort of against each other, right? And uh, sort of, uh, you, when you talk about Wall Street, you're really talking about, you know, mainstream wealth, right? And then you've got the government, which is generally what we're talking about with, with President Biden is maybe sort of a little bit of a move towards uh, taxing the rich and the wealth tax and that kind of thing. So those two are sort of diametrically opposed, yet they're sort of doing the same, they have the same objective. So so how does that, how so does that I, play out? I, it, it's, it looks like that on the surface and it's a very convenient takeaway, but we know that that is not the case. We know uh -huh. that um, the people who are wealthier get benefits through regulation and the way that regulation is crafted. And when they say they're going to hire 87,000 IRS agents to go after billionaires, and there's only maybe 800 billionaires in the United States, we know that that's not actually what's happening right. and that the yeah. billionaires have the, you know, the attorneys to, to push back. But if you look at Fed policy and government policy, and I would um, argue that those, even though they're supposed to be independent, they're very much joined at the hip. Um, despite the Fed's mandate, you know, they have been doing their best to prop up both Wall Street and government spending and allow the government to spend cheaply and um, easily. And you know that has enabled the most historic wealth transfer of all time. They have driven the most non-merit-based inequality of all time. Um, if you go back to you know what happened with COVID in 2020, the very first action that was taken was to prop up the stock markets. And they said, it's an emergency. We have to make sure that the financial markets are safe before they talked about anything else. Then they shut down primarily small businesses and you know transferred direct income from small businesses to you know their counterparts that were down the street. And you know through all of this, the Nasdaq at that point hit a new high Jan uh, June 5th of 2020 and they kept their emergency funding going for like almost a year after that. 
And in that time period, trillions of, you know, asset inflation. But what happened if you were just, you know, the average person? Okay, maybe you got a, like a thousand dollars of stimulus, which you're now paying for in goods inflation <laughs> and services right. inflation. Sure. But those policies, yeah, it sounds like they're not working together, but we see the outcome that they are very much working together and that that benefits the wealthy and the well connected and the inner circle. And it has been, you know, at the literal expense of Main Street America. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's a from the from Wall Street standpoint? That's just there's um, you know, when I I'm just thinking about what the reason for ultimately, like you know, as a real estate syndicator myself, I mean, I'm I I'm, I'm in the business of trying to create wealth for investors, right? So that really is, I mean, granted, you know, I'm. I'm a small time syndicator compared to the, you know, Black Rocks and all that, th those type of players out there. It, I, I have, a, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding how there's a, a motivation beyond just profit for themselves there, that it necessarily is something geared well, towards. They're, pres they're preserving that's their they're own. preserving their money and power. That, I mean, and, that's it. This, for, is not, this is not like some evil cabal sitting around going, oh, how could we? No, no, you know, I get like, it. How, how can we but, take over small America? It's like, ah, hey, it's a really cool way for us to get more money. And, you know, right. who cares what who else is getting it? But boy, this really benefits us. Great. Let's just double down on Isn't this. Isn't that the American way, though? Just building profit for yourself. I mean, at, I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate at the end of the day, like in business. Right. I mean. The American to way is to do it without, within a fr in a free way, without uh -huh. having central planners tipping the playing right. field to the direction of yeah. one party, and that's the issue. Is that if yeah. this just happened, that's fine. But having fifteen years of near zero interest rate policy with nine years of actual zero interest rate policy is yeah. tipping the scale in favor of Wall Street to give them trillions of extra dollars at the expense of your retirees and your yeah. savers and the people who are just getting in. So if that happens, that's great. But yeah. when you have a policy that says we're going to disrupt risk, we're going to say that there is no risk premium for money. Like that's a huge problem. Yeah, so, yeah. and that's why, well, that's why I say non-merit based inequality. Like if you are the person who outperforms and outcompetes, you're the Michael Jordan of whatever it is you do, you should absolutely get paid more, but it shouldn't right. be because some central bankers, you know, and some government folks went like, okay, well, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that this guy gets a bunch of money and screw everybody else. Yeah, that's very un-American. You don't have the too too big to fail uh, uh, net to 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 your back. You, you know, saving your ass if you if you if things don't go well, exactly. and the small guy doesn't have that. And look and look at too big to fail. I mean, it's a perfect example. You know, the the people the banks got bailed out, and you know, nearly six million people lost their home to foreclosures or short sales. That that's not a fair outcome yeah. right yeah. so you could have made a policy if you really wanted to save the little guys to say okay yeah. we're going to make sure or hey we're going to save the bank but we're going to make sure that you it works out for you it's like nah, we don't really care what happens to you but we're going to make sure our friends are good and then as i said you know now you have these these uh, big, huge companies who are coming in and have tons of money that they got for free, basically, yeah. uh, at everybody else's expense, by the way, that have now not only pushed up the prices of homes, but the outgrowth of that policy has now also pushed up the interest rates. So like it would be one thing if it was, you know, well, we still had low interest rates, but higher prices or vice versa. But now we have both. And it's impossible for young people. There was just an article that came out now that said it was like something like double um, what, what it would have been to buy the average house, um, you know, the, the oh, median gosh. house. Yeah. Yeah. Which like, is just absolutely... like a year ago. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, at, at the end of 2020. Yeah. At the end yeah. of 2020. Yeah. So with less than yeah. three years, um, that's just not a tenable situation. And that's not a, a free market capitalism right. winners and losers situation. Right. Got it. Um, I, I think I'm, I know the answer to this, but I mean, what, what's your thoughts on the wealth tax wealth tax, in my view, I mean, vital to ultimately crushing sort of the personal, uh, American dream and, 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 you know, the ability of somebody to, to, uh, 
just thrive. What's your take on on the wealth tax and what's going on right now? Wealth tax, an idea that is so bad that nine countries in Europe have already abandoned it. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a horrible idea. There is $84.4 trillion approximately that is set to turn over uh, voluntarily within the next couple of decades and a half. And this is a voluntary turnover. And you know, this is actually an opportunity for younger generations to hopefully kind of even things out um, with the older generations. And you know, despite what we've been talking about, you know, with the, the finger on the scale, putting more of a finger on the scale doesn't fix this. So I think it's a, a bad idea in anything where central planners um, you know, come into the, the mix here, I think is terrible. What I worry about the most, and I think this fits into the broader thesis, is that this is going to be a, a huge wealth heist. I mean, most of this money is coming from the middle class. And so if you cede property rights, if you cede the fact and say, well, you know, the billionaires don't deserve it, so I'm going to vote for it because it's not coming for me. That's when you lose the plot, you lose the principle, you lose your rights and eventually it does come for you. And I would argue because the billionaires are the ones who are funding the campaigns of the lawmakers. They're the ones with the fancy lawyers and the fancy accountants and the ways to get around this and to figure out the loopholes that they will probably find a way to protect their wealth. But the bulk of the people who end up getting hurt by whether it is, you know, a, a wealth tax, an inheritance tax, you know, this, you know, fake unrealized capital gains, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, they sort of couch it, you know, this is going to be the issue that impacts individuals and really hurts their ability to save money and to actually be able to own things. And it's just going to be a, a wholesale heist of wealth and ownership from the middle class. Fantastic. Thanks so much. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, again, uh, if you are interested, make sure you visit uh, wealthformula.com. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities coming down the pipeline. There are a few live things that, uh, you know, you know that we're talking about right now. There's uh, uh, that are actually open to everybody because they are of the regulation D506C variety, which is basically... Um, you know, you have to get third party, uh, letter of some kind certifying that you are an accredited investor, like a, by a CPA or some software, but you know, we have the, we still have, um, uh, the special on the, uh, ATM tranche. We have, uh, um, we have, it's not my thing, but if you, we, we talked a, a, a few weeks ago about, uh, the self-storage fund. That is uh, of interest. I mean, certainly uh, Reliant as a sponsor has been really, really good uh, partner in the past. I'm not a partner on this fund, but I am an investor. So there's that. And then we're going to have some interesting stuff in the aviation space coming up soon as well. But, but at any rate, that's it for me this week on Well Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.